హలో ఫ్రెండ్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ఈ పీజీ పాఠశాల దిస్ ఇస్ అంజు వల్లితికు ఫ్రమ్ ఫ్యాకల్టీ ఆఫ్ లా యూనివర్సిటీ ఆఫ్ ఢిల్లీ అండ్ ఐఎమ్ గోయింగ్ టు అడ్రస్ యూ ఆన్ ఇండివిజువలైజేషన్ ఆఫ్ పనిష్మెంట్ సెంటెన్సింగ్ డిస్క్రిషన్ అండ్ జస్టిస్ దట్ యాజ్ వీఆర్ ఆల్ అవేర్ దట్ క్రైమ్ అండ్ పనిష్మెంట్ ఆర్ రిలేటెడ్ యాజ్ కాజ్ అండ్ ఎఫెక్ట్ ఫర్ ఎన్షూరింగ్ ద పీస్ఫుల్ అండ్ హార్మోనియస్ కో ఎగ్జిస్టెన్స్ ఆఫ్ ఎ గివెన్ హ్యూమన్ సొసైటీ and as scientifically it has been proven that every action there has to be an equal and opposite reaction that is where there are various justifications given for punishing offenders who break the social fabric of the society there is no primary rationale and no coherent and universally applicable justification as to why do we punish whether one follows utilitarian approach or retributive philosophy the principle of proportionality is the principal consideration in setting penalty levels proportionality is better in utilitarianism and has a secure utilitarian foundation than in retributism principle of proportionality and perceived procedural fairness are key factors bringing about compliance with norms or laws in contrast disproportionate sentencing would lead to antipathy towards institutions or practices that condone such outcomes disproportionate sentence signifies harsh penalties for incapacitation and general deterrence towards the end of the last century andrew von hirsch scholarly writings have paved the way for the resurrection of retributism and he has come up with the theory of just deserts as criminal sanctions in order to individualize punishment it is to be found that how do we balance between the gravity of the offense and the individual offender and then find the most appropriate penalty that would be commensurate with the crime that has been committed the context of uh, this very talk is to examine how this concept has led to uncertainties illogicality and undermine the principle of stereotypes that is precedent in judges sentencing discretions in india the purpose of this lecture is also to analyze discretionary sentencing powers of the judiciary how this discretion is not uniformly exercised but individually applied in total disregard to the theory of just deserts the judges often pronounce different sentences even when the facts are so similar and overall conduct of the offenders has resulted in almost similar crimes what needs to be borne in mind is that the primary objective of this very particular deliberation would be to appreciate the distinction between the sentence and the sentencing process to understand the retributive theory in contrast to utilitarianism and deterrent as well as rehabilitative theories to understand the rationale of punishment as an end in itself on retributive philosophy rather than as a des- just desert as well as distinguish in form which is diametrically opposite to the understanding wherein we talk about rehabilitative approaches wherein we are not concerned with the crime rather we are more concerned with the criminal to be able to distinguish the just desert theory of retribution we need to focus on past act of the offender that is the crime whereas when we are talking about individualization of punishment we are focusing not only on the crime we are also talking about and focusing on the restoration of the harm social order to know the kinds of punishments statutorily sanctioned in the ipc and also to understand the process of judicial sentencing in india through the significant judicial decisions of the supreme court when we are talking about the purpose of punishment we need to understand that just desert is talking about a retributive theory of criminal punishment that proposes reduced and reduced judicial discretion to sentencing and specific sentencing for criminal conducts with little or no disregard to the individual offender it simply connotes deserved punishment or reward it proposes that an offender must receive what he she deserves appropriate punishment that means whatever is appropriate bearing in mind all the antecedent facts when we are talking about retributism in contrast to utilitarianism 
deterrent and rehabilitative theories, we need to appreciate that the retributive theory looks back to the offender at the time of the crime what has been committed and rationalizes the appropriate utilitarian considers the present need to assuage the victims and the feelings of the society. We need to somewhere correlate the wrongdoer with the society. The thin line is which differentiates retributive approach from the potential future criminals and the rehabilitative approach wherein we are talking about the reform or rehabilitation of the convict so that he will become a better and useful member of the community. Retributism comes in a variety of forms and according to Murray, we ought to punish offenders because and only because they deserve to be punished. Punishment is justified for a retributive solely by the fact that those receiving it deserve it. Retributism may be justified on account of fair play or censure too. According to Andrew Hirsch and Andrew Ashworth, the penal sanction should fairly reflect the harmfulness and the culpability of the actor's conduct. This treats people fairly, that is, like cases are to be treated alike and different cases are to be treated differently. That's how equality of treatment is meted out. Punishment should be proportionate is based on the premise that people are reasoning agents and penalties should respect citizens as persons. When we talk about the penalties due mainly to the inability of the utilitarianism, we understand that rehabilitation and deterrence also were not able to bring about any reduction in the crime rate. There has been a fallback on the law for retributive theories. Till date, the fusion or combination of all these theories has not been able to bring about any decline in the crime rate. So in order to find out the justification and what are the philosophies underlying Indian legislative theory and judicial decisions, we would certainly be looking into the kind of punishments that have been prescribed in the Indian Penal Code so that we find that whenever we are talking about punishments, Indian Penal Code gives us the kinds of punishments. We have got two laws. One is Indian Penal Code, another is the Criminal Procedure Code. And when we talk about the two of them, the two of them in fact are laying down a comprehensive code along with the Indian Evidence Act, which deals with the entire criminal justice administration. Though we also have special legislations like the NDPS that is Narcotic Drug and Psychotropic Substances Act or we have got Food Alteration Act. These special laws also have their own specifics with reference to the burden of proof and they may talk about certain other different norms. But as far as the criminal regime is concerned in India, all the processes are primarily governed by the Indian Penal Code coupled with the Criminal Procedure Code. The Indian Penal Code in Section 53 clearly lays down the types of punishments. And there are five kinds of punishments to be very precise. It talks about imprisonment, which may be rigorous or simple. In addition to IPC, there are some special and local laws detailing with those crimes which are not included in the IPC. For example, we have Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, Food Adulteration Act, Prevention of Corruption Act, Sexual Harassment Act, which talks about prevention, protection, and rehabilitation of women, which are a few illustrations. These special laws may have their independent norms with reference to arrest, bail, proof, etc. Still, it is primarily the IPC that contains the paramount framework for proscribing conduct as criminal. The Criminal Procedure Code 1973 consolidates the procedural laws for criminal justice administration. Thus, as a combination of these two codes along with the Indian Evidence Act 1872 that forms the framework 
for Criminal Justice Administration in India. Indian Penal Code 1860 in Chapter 3 of IPC deals with punishments. Section 53 envisages primarily five kinds of punishment. These include death sentence, life imprisonment, imprisonment which may be simple or rigorous, forfeiture of property and fine. Alongside section 73 prescribes solitary confinement. Section 54 deals with commutation of sentences of death whereas section 55 deals with commutation of sentence of life imprisonment. Section 57 clarifies that life imprisonment is to be constructed as imprisonment for a period of 20 years. After the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013, sections 376A, D and E have been added which have added a new dimension to the imprisonment which means that life imprisonment for the remainder of that person's life can be imposed. After the 2013 Criminal Law Amendment Act, section 376A, D, E have added a new dimension to the life imprisonment by specifying that it shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life. Criminal Procedure Code 1973 empowers the High Courts and the Sessions Court to impose any of these sentences except that in case death sentence is awarded by the Sessions Court it has to be confirmed by the high court of the state the subordinate judiciary has clearly specified powers and authority to try cases of specific nature and award punishments accordingly generally the ipc and other special laws dealing with crime provide for a discretionary paradigm of sentencing this is so because the maximum term of punishment is specified for a specific offense and the judge has the authority to determine the quantum of sentence to be awarded to a given case upon conviction more so under section 3235 sub clause 2 248 sub clause 2 and 253 sub clause 2 of crpc a separate phase of sentencing post conviction is envisaged generally after the pronouncement of conviction a separate date is fixed for hearing arguments on quantum of sentence where both the parties to the case are entitled to put evidence before the court relating to factors relevant for sentencing in alauddin mia's case in 1989 it has been laid down by the supreme court that hearing on the sentence is mandatory and a punishment pronounced without giving an opportunity of hearing on the sentence within the mandated requirements of law shall be quashed in appeal the final judgment is always at the end of hearing on sentence signifying the conclusion of trial the court has the power to release a person on probation of good conduct or after admonition simply under the provisions of crpc or for that matter probation of offenders act 1958 the court may award fine compensation imprisonment or capital punishment but it has to be a reasoned order Sections 432 and 433 CRPC empower the appropriate governments to suspend, remit or commute even life imprisonment as well as death sentence. Section 354 subclause 3 of CRPC talks about that whenever the conviction is for an offense punishable with death or in the alternative with imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a term of years the judgment shall state the reasons for the sentence awarded and in the case of sentence of death the special reasons for such sentence a combined reading of the aforementioned provisions makes it abundantly clear that judiciary in india has a significant role in sentencing process and they have unbridled discretion to exercise in so doing hence the sentencing in india is invariably a judge centric function rather than being a principled sentence centric function and the same gets further substantiated by an analysis of the following decisions of the supreme court of india analyzing the processes of judicial sentencing from the supreme court of india we understand that the first landmark case was bachan singh was a state of punjab in 1980 Briefly Bachan Singh was tried convicted and sentenced to death by the trial court 
under Section 302, Indian Penal Code, for killing three persons. The three murders were described as extremely heinous and inhuman. On appeal, the High Court confirmed the death sentence, pronounced on the appellant, and dismissed his appeal. Being dissatisfied, he further appealed to the Supreme Court. The question before the Supreme Court's constitutional bench was, inter alia, the sentencing procedure embodied in subsection 3 of section 354 of the CRPC. The Supreme Court, while delivering the landmark judgment, relied upon Jagmohan's case to affirm constitutionality of death sentence. It also brought a paradigm shift by considering factors relevant not only to the crime, that is the past fact, but also factors attending to the criminal, and categorically stated that death penalty shall be imposed for murder considering the manner of commission of murder, the motive for commission of murder, antisocial or socially abhorrent nature of the crime, magnitude of crime, and personality of victim of murder. Thus, Bachchan Singh marks a watershed in death penalty jurisprudence in India. Those steps, therefore, form the premises of any conclusion to be reached in each and every case. Hence, in the instant case, the apex court noted that the prosecution, that is the state, had to discharge its burden of proof on why the judgment sentences of the courts below should be sustained. To make its case strong, the prosecution tendered the 1967 report, the 35th Law Commission report of India, the judgments of the Supreme Court and relied on Jagmohan Singh's case as well as other similar later cases. The pieces of evidence furthered the state's contention that death penalty serves as a deterrent against criminal conducts. Having accepted the prosecution's submission, the court shifted the burden on the petitioners to prove and establish that the death sentence for murder was so outmoded, unusual or excessive as to be devoid of any rational nexus with the purpose and object of the legislation. While strongly condemning the action of the appellant and the wave of heinous criminal activities in India, the court by the majority judgment rejected both the challenges to the constitutionality of the sentencing procedure and death penalty provided under Section 354, Subclause 3 of the CRPC, as well as under Section 302 IPC. Then again, in Machi Singh's 1983 decision, we find the rarest of rare case doctrine enunciated by Bachan Singh's case needed some kind of precision. The main guidelines to be followed in the application was one of the issues that emerged that attention of the court in Maji Singh's case was brought to. In that case, a violent dispute between two families resulted to the loss of 17 lives. The appellant and his associates were tried by the Sessions Court and at the conclusion of their prosecution, the appellant was among four that were sentenced to death. His death penalty was confirmed by the Punjab High Court, necessitating his appeal to the Supreme Court. While hearing the appeal, the apex court, adhering to the rarest of rare cases from Bachan Singh's, further reformed the guidelines. To start with, the court held that the extreme penalty of death need not be inflicted except in gravest cases of extreme culpability. The challenge facing the law courts the academia and researchers is how to specifically determine the ingredients of or what amounts to the gravest cases of extreme culpability. In what can be understood as a Supreme Court's response to the question, the Apex Court stated that before opting for the death penalty, the circumstances of the offender also require to be taken into consideration along with the circumstances of the crime. So, two considerations are crucial, the antecedents of criminal record of the offender and the circumstances leading to the crime of the murder committed. This can be further clarified to mean that if the offender is a first offender or has no criminal record, then he stands a good chance of being sentenced to life imprisonment instead of death 
irrespective of the offense committed in other words the attention of the court goes away from the crime and the victim and leniently focuses on the person of the offender is that the most appropriate and objective reasoning to be prioritized if so how have the interests or the right of the victim or the family and that of the larger society catered for how many times should a person commit crime before he will be adjust a danger to the lives of others to restore public confidence these need to be taken into consideration again from the reasoning of the learned justices the supreme court seems to have one answer to these it is that life imprisonment is the rule and death sentence is an exception in other words death sentence will be imposed only when life imprisonment appears to be an altogether inadequate punishment this in addition to having regard to the relevant circumstances of the crime and provided and only provided the option to improve sentence of imprisonment for life cannot be conscientiously exercised having regard to the nature and circumstances of the crime and all the relevant circumstances these lines of reasoning further intensify the impasse those guidelines are governed by one word and it is discretion of the judges being so matters of discretion can hardly have an abc end to end formula furthermore strictly upholding life imprisonment as the rule and death sentence as an exception is jeopardizing the retributive and deterrent theories of punishment will a prospective offender fully aware and who rationalizes on the fact that life imprisonment is the rule and death sentence is an exception be still deterred from furthering his criminal enterprise murderous criminal may take advantage of that rule by reducing the level of brutality and extremism as an escape route if that happens will the end of the law still stand served as if unmindful of the palpable fears the supreme court went ahead to hold that a balance sheet of aggravating and mitigating circumstances has to be drawn up and in doing so the mitigating circumstances have to be accorded full weightage and a just balance has to be struck between the aggravating and the mitigating circumstances before the option is exercised probably prioritizing the rehabilitative and restorative theories of criminal punishment all these go to the benefit of the offender and the offended that is victim is left out of the picture this is individualization not generalization of sentencing procedure justice should be dispensed to all parties be functionally backward and forwarding looking otherwise the search for solution to individualization of sentencing is, is still early in the day another case of swami shraddhanand of 2009 is a landmark decision this was a case dealing with murder by the convict of his wife for her property justice aftab alam distinguished the contextual setting of maji singh and categorically highlighted the changed socio economic scenario of the 21st century with the emergence of terrorist activities gang rapes parliamentary bombings the professional criminality emerging on criminal scene and faced with an appeal against death penalty in this case the supreme court held that the court may feel that the punishment more just and proper in the facts of the case would be imprisonment for life till the last breath without remission sunil bariar's case is another case wherein the court again tracing the evolution of death penalty jurisprudence in india in bachan singh's case it was a case of kidnapping for ransom and murder the supreme court overruling death penalty by the trial court and confirmed by the high court awarded life imprisonment giving weightage to the factors like there was no previous criminal record 
unemployment resulting in need for money and that's how life imprisonment was awarded claim for commutation or remission under section 433 crpc from appropriate government was explicitly denied by the supreme court in nazir khan versus others case the three appellants before the court were sentenced to death for committing offenses punishable under section 364 a read with section 120 b ipc along with tada offenses the supreme court however commuted to the death sentence of the three appellants but having regard to the gravity of the offenses and the dastardly nature of their acts directed for their incarceration for a period of 20 years with the further direction that the accused appellants would not be entitled to any remission from the term of 20 years mohammad arif's case is another landmark decision from delhi where the imprecise and individualization quagmire of sentencing procedure in india was captured and more appreciated it is a more recent decision decided almost 30 years after the guideline attempted in bachan singh's case the supreme court at para 30 deflected a little from the death penalty cases because of their relevance to the context the supreme court deemed it necessary to make certain general comments on sentencing the court agreed that crime and punishment are two sides of the same coin that punishment must fit the crime this is the philosophy behind the theory of just desert the opinion of the court was that the notion of just deserts or a sentence proportionate to the offender's culpability was the principle which by passage of time became applicable to criminal jurisprudence the latest judgment in nirbhaya's matter is a case in point wherein the supreme court confirmed death penalty on all five adult offenders on the charges of gang rape what is intriguing is that there are concurrent judgments on the quantum of sentence reaching the same conclusion but with different and detailed reasoning this clearly underscores the quantum of sentence in discretion vesting in the judiciary accordingly recognizing to the ongoing debate supreme court noted that it was not out of place to mention that in all of the recorded history that there has never been a time in crime and punishment have not been the subject of debate and difference of opinion more importantly the court admitted and there are no statutory guidelines to regulate punishment in india it follows therefore that in practice there is much variance in the matter of sentencing that unlike several countries around the world with laws prescribing sentencing guidelines there is no statutory sentencing policy in india till date what the indian penal code prescribes is only the maximum punishments for offenses and in some cases the minimum mandatory punishments consequently judges exercise very wide discretion within the statutory limits and the scope for arriving at sentence is huge the task of deciding the quantum of punishment is left to the judiciary to reach after hearing the parties evaluating attaching weights to the pieces of evidence adduced in the absence of such statutory guidelines judges discretion prevails here lies the major challenge of ensuring consistency uniformity regularity illogicality in contrast to logicality stability and reliability on judgments finally the emphasis remains that determining the quantum of punishment by passing the appropriate sentence is quite onerous and still a challenge to the judges in india the need or pressure on the judges to be more determinate and consistent makes the sentencing function even more demanding there are numerous other circumstances that do justify the passing of lighter and different sentences between similar cases in india this is not withstanding the fact 
that the end results of the criminal conduct are one and the same. For instance, in the offense of murder, the fact that death was the result in a group of similar cases would not ipso facto compel the judges to pass death penalty on each offender. As can be seen from the analyzed cases already, that there are intervening circumstances that do alter the course of sentencing process. For instance, the nature of the crime, the age, the personality, the antecedents of the offender, the mode of committing of the crime, the aggravating and other discretionary but inexact factors that sway the minds of the judges. For instance, the nature of the crime, the age, personality, antecedents of the offender, the mode of the committing the crime, aggravation and other discretionary but inexact factors that sway the minds of the judges one way or the other. Majority of the justices in Bachchan Singh's case acknowledged that we cannot obviously feed into a judicial computer all such situations since they are astrologically imponderables in an imperfect and undulating society. The court noted further that for persons convicted of murder, life imprisonment is the rule and death sentence an exception. That a real and abiding concern for the dignity of human life postulates resistance to taking a life through the instrumentality of the law. Indeed, that shouldn't be done, save in the rarest of rare cases. That is, when the alternative option is unquestionably foreclosed. An emphasis to be put on this unquestionably foreclosed. Sunil Dutt Sharma versus the Government of National Capital Territory of Delhi is another case. The Supreme Court dealt with sentencing philosophy in greater detail in this case and went on to say that the principles of sentencing evolved by the courts over the years though largely in the context of death penalty will also be applicable to all lesser sentences this should not and cannot be mechanically adopted the sentencing judge should be one that is vested with the discretion to award a lesser or a higher sentence therefore the Supreme Court materially explored and evolved new principles on sentencing practices during 2013. Since the law needs to be dynamic to cater for the needs of ever-changing society, more sentencing modifications and evolvements should be accepted from the Supreme Court. Without unnecessarily overflogging the points, the scope and concept of mitigating factors in the area of death penalty need not be given too liberal and expansive a construction. Otherwise, the individualization of sentencing and the dilemma thereof will be further deepened to the detriment of all the worshippers in the temple of justice and society at large. The legislative sentencing guide under Section 354, Subclause 3 of CRPC may only serve as the foundation until a more narrowed down and comprehensive sentencing guideline is formulated. Till date, neither the legislature nor the judiciary has issued structured criminal sentencing guidelines in India. Section 235-2 CRPC contains just a procedure to be followed in cases of sentencing. A person convicted of a crime. It is more of a mercy plea, provisional opportunity wherein the convict should be called upon to show cause while the maximum penalty should not be imposed on him. The convict's submission may be outside the facts and issue. The social standing of the convict may mitigate the punishment and could influence the judge in deciding the sentence. Fully aware of the absence and the need for the guidelines, what the Supreme Court has succeeded in doing is the provision of judicial guidance in the form of principles and factors that courts must take into consideration while exercising sentencing discretion. 
this is not enough and worrisome as far as determining appropriate sentence is concerned worrisome because the ongoing individualization of sentencing has created and still creates lots of uncertainties in the quantum of punishments being awarded by courts to ensure justice in each and every case punishment requires deliberations outside the nature of the crime committed and circumstances surrounding the commission after conviction it is obviously the duty of the judiciary to award appropriate sentence the absence of statutory sentencing guidelines to assist judges in discharging this all important duty have left a wide vacuum in the machinery of justice dispensation in india widely leaving sentencing open to the discretion of the judges is not the most ideal criminal administration policy indian judiciary has come of age and deserves appropriate sentencing policy individualization your non uniform or random sentencing status in india needs to give way for certainty and logicality in the award of sentence having sentencing guidelines in place will enable the courts respond to the daily cry for justice and the yearnings of the community the judges should be able to award appropriate punishment proportionate to crime and the feelings of society it is only by so doing that the retributive and just desert theories of criminal punishment can be met quite a few committees set up by the government have emphasized the importance of having sentencing guidelines in india having these will definitely address individualization of punishment and minimize the uncertainties surrounding the award of sentences in india the rights of the victim the offender and the society should be simultaneously considered in any sentence that will pass the justice test having these will definitely address individualization of punishment and minimize the uncertainties surrounding the award of sentences in india the rights of the victim the offender and the society should be simultaneously considered in any sentence that will pass the justice test thank you very much for watching this video